All right, let's jump right into it. Thank you, everybody, for attending episode 39 in Let's Talk Recruiting, uh, where peers in our industry get together and talk shop on various topics. And the topic today, five character five characteristics of a great recruiting team lead. Uh, everybody loves working for a great team leader or a de uh, department leader, and those people in that leadership position, I think, will strive to be a great leader. Uh, I don't know if anyone on the panel or in the audience, but I've actually worked with the same leader at multiple different companies. I, I tend to notice that great teams kind of move around together, which I always thought was like a good sign of a good working team and a leader if people follow them. So that, that's my point of, point of topic to start this discussion. But with us today, we have Tony Rotan. Tony, am I saying your name right? Yes. Gotcha. Out of Charlotte and Kathy Berry out of Chicago, and Manisha oh, Bavabai, did I get it right? Close enough, Bavabai. Oh, I apologize. But no worries. At least I'm close. And <laughs> Tony Pottle out of Dallas, and Manisha is out of Atlanta. I forgot to note that. So what we're gonna do today is sort of go to do a, a round table discussion and have each panelist kind of touch on a key item. For audience, feel free to add any comments or questions in the chat area. And Tony Rotan, we're going to start with you first, if that's okay. Sure. And Sean, thank you for the invite originally for this. When I saw these uh, topics come across, and I really gravitated to this one because it's super important for me and in our culture here at Compass Group and my previous cultures across the uh, my career, which is really defining what that is for people and help them develop and grow into you know, our future leaders. And, you know, when I saw that, I kind of gravitated back to that great advice that I got when I was early in my career and moving into my first leadership role, which was I got asked, you know, hey, be, be humble. And um, the first thing I said was, all right, great, don't be cocky, check the ego, I get that, it makes sense to me. But as I grew in my career, I learned that it meant a lot more than just being, you know, check the, check the ego. It's, it's, there's a lot, a lot that falls underneath that bucket and why, why it's so important for me uh, as well. And it really kind of stems from part of that is that empowerment piece, right? So one, as a leader, you, you really have to empower your team for them to be able to do the work. If you trust they're going to get it done or you ask them to do the work and they just do it, if you let them be autonomous and own that, 99.9% .9 of the time they're going to do it right because they also want to do well. And if you give them the opportunity to, they'll do it. And you don't have to know all the answers. And you don't have to check every single piece of work that goes through um, and I think when you do that, it, it kind of creates kind of that opposite effect, right? So being, being able to empower your team is super important uh, for that element. And then, you know, in that, you know, that, that humbleness piece, you kind of create what I always kind of say, it's a little bit of um, collaborative environment, right? So you, you really work together as a group and you, you don't have to know all the answers. I think I said that before, but when you, when you really let the team kind of come forward and, and be equals, right? And that's important too. And, and highlight some of the challenges that they may be facing and work with each other. You maybe facilitate that dialogue and you may learn something as well because not every leader knows every, the answer to every question. And I think that's important as well as be able to, to demonstrate that with, with your teams. And it kind of still falls in that same bucket. And it generates a little bit more integrity of the day-to-day -day job, right? So if, you, if you're, you have a high level of integrity, you're gonna praise your team for the outcomes that were expected anyway. Um, and so you kind of build that, that culture of that, that creativity, you're, you're building that culture of collaboration, and it generates that integrity level that really defines a team and makes it recognizable from others. So just being able to walk the talk and talk the talk is one thing, but when everyone on the team sees that in you, that quality, it's not about what you see in yourself, but how does your team respond to you? How does your team feel about your leadership? that's where that comes from, right? So, so having a great leader, you recognize that leader is a great leader comes from that element, right? So that when they don't, they're not in, in a power hungry person, they don't put people down, they create um, that, um, that environment where it's okay to make mistakes. And because when you do that too, it, it stems creativity because people will be creative in an environment where they feel like it's okay to fail. Um, and that's important as well, because then it kind of gets into that levels of, you know, from that you break into kind of the empathetic approach. Um, you're really just what we call being human. And when you're, when you're human 
and you create that sense of trust, that, that collaborative environment, ultimately you generate a level of equity uh, and equality uh, across your team. That equality culture is really important, um, especially even right now when we're looking across the, the landscape across the U.S. where that is something that seems to be missing in other places, but it stems from that leadership in your organization. When you build on all of those foundations, ultimately you end up with that, that equitable group that feels cohesive. And then again, that all starts with being humble. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll add from a, when I was a much younger man in, in my infantry days, one of the things that we would do is always watch to see if an officer ate before his platoon. You know, it was always, I can't remember, there's a colonel that would promote this as a simple rule in leadership, eat last. Right? And if, if you eat last, that means you're putting everybody before you, right? And those times where people are kind of anxious and literally hungry, but that, that sort of stuck with me for many years, that concept of eat last when you're a leader. Mm-hmm. But Tony, let me ask you a question around the word empowerment. So when you're talking about empowering your team, is this kind of a, a state of mind or is this literally responsibilities and duties or a combination of both? Or, or it's a combination of both. Um, and, I, and I really appreciate that question because you know, that's one that, again, you have to kind of think about how you define that. But yeah, empowerment is both. It's a state of mind. And it also has to be something that they feel that's okay, right? So you're, you're giving people permission to be empowered, but you have to create that environment. So it is giving them that responsibility to own the outcome. And then from that, you either get the praise of win or, hey, it's some coaching that maybe we could have done this differently. But either way, it's still a safe place to be. But, you know, re- leaders can't own everything that comes to, across their desk. You have to be able to delegate. You got to be able to trust that it gets done. And, you know, those leaders that try to hold on to everything kind of sometimes struggle. I always kind of see their time management skills kind of, kind of really are challenged because they have all these people coming at them and they have to approve everything. And it goes back to that same point. If, if your team is doing the work that they're supposed to be doing and you've built that, that, that culture within your function, um, you're going to one, you're going to be a little, little less focused on all those little minutia details, but really focusing on those bigger topics and some of those more strategic placement activities that need to occur some of the conversations but end of the day your your folks are are recruiters and they're doing their job the way they're supposed to do it and that's why you pay them to do the job and you know being you being a leader that sits and just looks at everything that comes across the desk and gives them permission to do the next thing um, you know you're not really giving them much opportunity for advancement and growth in the long term. Kathy or Tony anything else to add Manisha? Yeah, actually, um, it reminded me of a great book by uh, Daniel Pink called Drive. It really did a study of all the people just had that intrinsic motivation. They just did whatever it took, no matter what, whether there's the external motivation or, or not. And, you know, what uh, what Tony was saying there, really, the number one is uh, the leader creating that vision, making sure that people have the resources and support, and then get out of the way. <laughs> you know, let them let them do it. I I love actually what you said, um, that military reference, because I truly believe a a team lead is really a servant leader. So, um, and, you know, a lot of my military, you know, uh, veteran cohorts have taught me that throughout the course, you know, of my career. Uh, So I do a lot of work with military hiring and it taught me that concept. And that's really where I see uh, where a team lead falls into place, right? And and people do follow individuals that they've worked with, right? It's, it's who you work with and who you work for, not necessarily always the company, right? I currently work for a team lead that I was a partner with 20 years ago, you know? And the reason I joined iRhythm was initially because I knew her leadership style and that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be a part of an organization who would hire someone like that, right? So, um, so, you know, I like the, the points you both brought up, right, about being that humble, you know, that servant leader, you know, and doing the feeding last, right? So, interesting. Anisha, anything to add on empowerment? Um, I don't think so. There's a few things that, uh, that I, you know, once I get a chance to talk, uh, that are sort of transition into what he mentioned. Yeah, uh, one place... Um... I ended up, I came in replacing a, a, another director and the team 
that was reporting to him, now reported to me. I asked one of my one of the team members, what was the thing that you liked least about my predecessor? And she said he took credit for my work. I would do work and then he would go present it as his. So to that point, every piece that she came up with, she was going to present it as high up as we could get it uh, to present. And that she took off like a rocket with, with getting that opportunity to do it. But she's very adamant. She's proud of her work. It's good work. She wants to be known for it. So it's like, to your point, Tony, about empowering them. Absolutely. It's sort of fell along those lines to get out of their way, as you said, and let them do the work. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kathy, let's, let's jump over to you and uh, your point. Sure. Sure. So, um, so actually, thanks for pointing both those things out. So I think um, for me, another big piece of, of being a team lead, in addition to not being a team, team lead over the course of my career, I think um, for me, one of the biggest things is to really be a partner with that person's individual development plan, their IDP is what I call it. Um, how can I, as a team lead, and or the team lead that I report to, how can they lead me into developing further into my career, right? What educational opportunities can they point out to me? Um, I like to focus on people's strengths and build on those, right? Um, and I think a team lead really has to be that positive influence more so, right, than the opposite. A team lead is really in that middle position, right? It's that first step into management for some people. Um, And depending on how your company is structured, um, you can have a lot of responsibility, right? Or you could be one of the crew, you know, and work alongside of everyone. But I truly feel that a team lead needs to come at it from a positive perspective and how can they work and educate their peers um, and introduce them to possible educational opportunities that they wouldn't have heard of otherwise. Be an advocate for LinkedIn learning. Um, be an advocate for attending seminars such as this, right? Where we can have positive discussions about different things in our industry. Point out opportunities even within the, the organization, right? That they may not be aware of um, in ways that they can develop further. And I think it's really also important that a, a team lead not be condescending, right? That um, they really truly, like Tony said, be humble and have that approach with their peers, right? And be that person that they can come to, you know, if they don't know the answer to something or if they want to learn more about a different opportunity. So for me, being a big part of a team lead um, is is helping your team identify those learning opportunities um, and, and learning about things and introducing them to things that they might not be, you know, aware of to further their own development in their career. So. So Kathy, with an IDP, an individual sure. development plan, yeah. you're, you're putting that on paper or is it kind of conversation? I like, to, I like to put it on paper because I believe when, when you see a tangible goal or when you see something in front of you, it's a great sense of accomplishment when you can check it off, right? Um, and when you can complete that and show someone that you have accomplished your goals, right? So, you know, whether it be different types of speaking engagements, whether it be learning a new sourcing tool, whether it's, you know, I think I like personally, I like to have those written down for team and when I'm developing them, right? We can see where we were, we can see where you're at now, we can see where you wanna go in the future. So I think it's important that those things are written down. Now is it to the point where you ask for a signature from the team member on it to get that commitment of signing an agreement? Not as a team lead. I think um, I think that's a, a manager's place, right, okay. to do that. I think a team lead should be more of a guide, right, and making suggestions and helping those individuals come up with their own development plan and really, you know, reinforcing what they're good at, right, and um, helping them come up with the ideas to build their own IDP. So. Yeah, you know, Kathy, yeah, that's a good point, and I think it's when you when you especially say help them come up with what is that learning look like? Right. Or what is that area of development that they need? And, and I, I love that piece of it because, you know, if, especially if you work in a cult, an organization that has kind of a deep learning library or uh, elements that are at, at their disposal for different learning mediums, when you really sit down with somebody and you kind of walk through what that looks like and help them kind of say, you know, what, what do you really want to be good at that you don't feel like you got there yet? Or maybe it's the mm-hmm. great level of greatness mm-hmm. that you're not quite there yet. 
right. you lay out that list of things and you let them sign up for that. And then you you talk to them about it as they go, as they develop their career and they go through those learning sessions, they can walk out of there going, Hey, I learned this today. Right. It creates dialogue in those kind of one-on-one -on -one meetings too. But what did you learn from that class today? And, and it's pretty, it's really important, I think, to your, to, to what you're saying and as it comes to having that team lead play a big role in that, because that helps create that exact same thing where you, you, you're giving, you're supporting them. You're being yes. that, that, that person that's going to help them develop their career, whether it, it be it, their own self-learning. It self builds trust. It Absolutely. builds trust with your team. And, you know, if this is the first step into a leadership role with the organization, it's, you're building a positive sense of trust with your team so that if you do get elevated into a management role, right, you've already built that connection and you've already built that trust with your team. They know that you have their best interest at heart. So as a manager, it's, it's easier to develop them in areas where they may need development, right? And it's easier to have those conversations. So you're opening the door as a team lead to develop that. Um, so I'm getting into succession planning a little bit too, but, um, but you can see where the strengths are of your team, right? So if you end up leading this team as a manager, you're going to know exactly what your team is good at and where they need development down the road. Yeah, I heard a couple, both of the, you say, really the human element, the, the true connecting their best interests, you know, that, that truly looking out for that person. And, you know, I even like mm -hmm. to change the language instead of individual development plan. That's the official HR word, but I actually like to use career advancement plan because this is my partnership with you. It's not about developing you. It's about helping you get to where you want to go. And, um, you know, that, that becomes uh, even more powerful. And then that also helps when you say, hey, let's write this now. It's not about accountability. Because again, accountability feels like you're, you're getting beat up. You don't get this, you're going to get this consequence, but it's about helping you get to where you want right. to go. Right, you're right. I'm not their manager, I'm their peer, who's a subject matter expert, right? And so I, I don't necessarily feel that, you know, a signature is required. It's not a performance, it's not a performance plan, right? right. Um, you know, I'm helping them develop um, not just in their career, right, but as an individual. So that's why I like to call it an individual plan because it's, it's custom tailored to you, your personal growth in addition to your career growth, right? I believe those two work in tandem. I've heard the phrase career ladder. I think Susan Ross from Relic, who's been on our summer panels, she has a similar item and their term is career ladder, where it shows from each role there's a career ladder for that role versus getting into your point, Kathy, of that individual piece of it. So it's right. not like they go right. hand in hand in a way. Any, any other panels want to, to add to, to Kathy's point there? I, would, I was going to ask you, um, do you sort of put, do we think those are, it's kind of like a learning ladder, right? I, I'm sort of, I really love the, the phrase career ladder because it's, hey, you're moving up, right? You get the, you can put all kinds of collateral around marketing collateral within your team on it. I actually like learning ladder. I might use that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're talking about, right? You learn this, you yeah. learn this, you learn this. Yeah. Right. I, I just think it's the clearly, that's what I was asking about. Is this a signature thing where it's clearly defined and hey, we're both committing to it. Um, that's where the piece where I think is that mutual connection and you can come back yeah. you know, each quarter. Where are we at? Where are you at on your ladder or right. what have you, or your yeah. plan? All right. Excellent. Uh, Manisha, let's uh, jump over to you and to your item. Hey guys, thanks for uh, having me um, today. Um, I'm the head of recruiting over at Hudson MX and we're a software startup. Uh, we provide a media buying solution. And prior to Hudson MX, uh, I was in the staffing world for about eight years. So I uh, started off as a recruiter and then moved into a, a lead role. And then my last two years I was in sales. Um, after about, uh, about a year ago, I uh, decided to make that transition uh, into more of a corporate recruiting position. Um, we've had a mass amount of growth uh, in the past year. We've gone from 22 employees to about 90. Uh, so it's been really exciting uh, just to see the company grow. Um, a majority of the positions that I typically recruit on are uh, IT focus, so like software engineers, uh, QA, DevOps, uh, program project management, um, and then anything else, you know, uh, finance related. 
And um, in terms of, you know, some things that I think are important uh, when saying, hey, I have a great team lead or even a boss is to me, it's someone who's inspiring uh, that has that mentor advisory uh, mindset, right? Not only for your team, but also for other folks that might be inside your organization and even outside. Um, an example for me is that I worked with before, or if you want to say team lead uh, for my last staffing firm, he was uh, one of the best like team leads that I've reported to for a few reasons. Um, and some of these things that you guys may have covered, right? It's giving lots of autonomy, but also just inspiring with how being inspiring on how passionate he was about helping people be better um, and just putting in the extra effort to provide advice and mentorship, whether it was recruiting or uh, even like personal goals that I was interested in achieving. Um, he was willing to listen to like his direct reports. He had open communication when it comes to like sharing new ideas. And uh, I think that inspired a lot of folks uh, in the organization just to go above and beyond adapt these characteristics themselves. I think, you know, staffing can be mentally taxing and having that genuine mentorship, it really assisted in my success and just making me a better. And even uh, after I left, right, we've continued to stay in touch and we catch up once in a while. And I think that portrays great qualities, right, of a great recruiting leader who's willing to spend time uh, giving you advice uh, whether you're working together or after you've left the organization. So, Manisha, you're, that mentoring was sort of kind of like a, an informal version of mentoring, right? Sort of compared to like where some places will try to have a formalized mentoring program. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think it would be more on the informal side. But if you had a choice, formal or informal, and I don't mean to sound like I'm all about formalities with pay, signing papers and formal mentoring. Uh, I think it falls under like what Tony was talking about, about empowering people is that informal mentoring seems to have the ability to become contagious and get within a team versus having to follow a, a formal mentoring. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, so just based on my experience, I've really, I would say only have worked in more informal environments, right? I haven't necessarily worked a corporate larger company where there's a lot of process. Um, so, you know, one example I can give is, you know, we, I work for a smaller company right now and it's a requirement, right? An unsaid requirement to wear multiple hats considering we only have one individual in HR and then myself, uh, in talent acquisition. Um, and so with that being said, I tried my best to play the informal role as an advisor, right? Um, and just mentor, whether it's from the be beginning of the interaction of the interview process with someone to even after they're hired. Um, I think just having that experience and with my previous manager, I've taken what I've learned and brought it into, you know, Hudson MX. And I think uh, creating great relationships with the folks internally um, has, I think been well appreciated in the sense of, hey, you're another point of contact that may also understand some of the things that are going on that, hey, I might be concerned or frustrated with and pushing them to have that conversation with the right person. And I think that's helped a lot with just retention and, you know, employees feeling like they have multiple resources to reach out to. Here's a question kind of for the panel around mentoring, kind of in the current state of the world that we're in, where essentially everything's Zoom, right, or some type of video. Does Can mentoring and empowering and all the topics we've talked about still continue to kind of exist in the world of video working? And any, any thoughts on that? For, for me, I actually think it's it's been more enhanced. I've actually been closer to my peers and other folks within our company um, closer now than we were when we were in the office. I, you know, talk to my peers via video very much like this, more so than I did when we were two cubicles away. So 
for us, you know, and, and at iRhythm, it's, it's, it's really enhanced that versus been a detriment in my opinion and in my experience. You know, in the, uh, in the past, I actually had a team that was very global from Australia to Dubai, South Africa, and there was, there was three years before I actually met any of them. And we still created that bond. And I think it's because it was more explicit and deliberate. You know, sometimes when you're together, you, you dismiss, well, I can just get with them anytime and you get caught up in your work. You know, Tony, you actually said the right word, deliberate. You, you have to be deliberate. You have to yep. want to do it because tr truly working from home, you're out of sight, out of mind. You have to make a conscious effort to engage with people regularly and, and create that sense of engagement that may have been missing during that time period. Because when you think about like, well, at least for us, it's been almost 20 weeks I, I've been working from home that I typically yeah. worked in the office every day. And in that time period, it's easy to get lost. So it's good that you said that it's, it's really important that we have to be deliberate with it. Any final comments on Manisha's uh, mentoring piece? Thank you, Manisha. Uh, Tony, let's jump over to you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wanted to really talk about the importance that the team lead ensures that each and every person on their team is creating that positive, unforgettable experience for the candidates, you know, the internal employees, for the managers. And, you know, it really starts with that team lead, you know, and you'll see those two words again, positive and unforgettable. Um, because, you know, we have a difficult job and there's some days that are good, some days that are not. And so it really begins with that team lead. And Tony, you mentioned it. And, and that is about creating that vision. And like for myself, it's really ensuring that each and every person has the chance to shine and be their best. Um, and to communicate that vision, not only for each of my team members so they can shine and be their best, but also for every single candidate as well. So even if that candidate doesn't move forward in a position, they walk away saying, wow, what a great company and be that advocate in the field for us because that we need all the marketing help that we can get. Um, and, and again, there's something playing against us and that's stress. Um, we see that in the environment now. We see that with our candidates. And the reason I like to kind of bring that up is we have seen that when people in, in a stressful situation, their ability to think clearly goes down measurably, 41 to 47 percent. So about half. And so you're expecting this person to be the best that they can be. But if we're not setting things up in the right way, we're actually hamstringing them as well. But there's a couple things that we can uh, we can do to help with that. But I wanted to pause there for, for a moment. I like your philosophy on that almost as if like they're in a, you're an ambassador, right? For the company internally as well as to external customers too, right? Your candidates and anybody who you're gonna entertain within the organization. I like that philosophy. Mm. It's good. Thank you. So, sort of, um, oh, okay. sorry. No, no, go ahead. So, so one of the things, uh, there's two, two elements I just wanted to speak with here. Um, one of the items that I noticed in our master research is one of the key ways that we can ensure that someone's brain gets stressed is to put them in front of a panel and critique them, right? And if you think about the recruiter doing interviews, uh, uh, performance improvement plans, even day-to-day -day trying to give feedback, you know, we kind of put people in that kind of state. So really, there's a couple things that we can do. One is, first off, how do we make sure we do that personal connection? You've all talked about that a bit, um, but I did want to mention something as far as brain science behind there. We continually go into our own brain and we're thinking about ourselves. That's that little chatter that's going on in our heads all the time. And uh, when we do that, it's in a special area of the brain. And when we meet somebody um, for the first time, especially if we're a higher title, um, the brain immediately assigns that person as a foe. And that means now there's not that trust. Now, because of our personalities and experiences, some of us uh, are able to reassess that to a friend, but to recognize in the very beginning, the brain does this automatically. And so it's up to us to find that connection with that person, whether that's from 
where they grew up, what school they went to, what companies they've worked with, the affiliations and so on. Because if I can help make that connection, whether it's with that team member as a team lead or helping them see, here's something we need to do. Let's not just take six seconds on a resume. Let's take a little more time to find that commonality and, uh, and then work with those candidates to help them feel calm. And I'll talk about the other one, but I just wanted to pause for just a moment there. Uh, keep, keep going, Tony. Okay. All right. The, the other item is what I call turn the tables because this is all really based on the whole concept of psychological safety. You probably hear more and more about that. But when we uh, go into a meeting without an agenda or we say, hey, can you come to my office and talk? We're putting people in kind of a threat state. Right, and that puts that uh, that ability for them to think clearly goes down. So really, it's about how do we create more certainty? How do we uh, tell them here's here's kind of what we're going to be doing now, uh, whether that's as a recruiter or as a team lead, um, and also recognizing again, our brain automatically says, "Hey, it's my boss. Um, I'm going to be in a, a state of threat," and just reminding them, "You, Kathy, you said it. We're equals here because." you're brilliant at what you do that's why we're all together and to just keep reminding that not in a fake way but truly look for all those opportunities throughout every day and i truly mean that where they shined where they did well and then say something about it because too often we don't I, when when the attendees registered we, i asked them here you know, what is the characteristic that you have in, in great leaders and i think the it was kind of spread across the board, but one that stood out perhaps the most out of all of them, if I bucketed them, was empathy. Is it, if, if we're going to do a one word kind of summary of, you know, not to take away from anything like Tony, but because it's that everything you're describing kind of fall under that world of empathy in a way. It is. And you'll see more and more out there that we talk about our brains are very much a social brain. And so we need to make that connection with other humans to have that empathy. So, yeah, I love it. Uh, has anybody ever coached a youth sports or <laughs> um, yeah. okay so let me ask you this one because i think it i think coaching kids is very very similar to leading in corporate america <laughs> i i wouldn't i totally disagree with you um it is <laughs> okay corporate america. oh fire back at me a little bit and i'll so here, here's why i think it is you have to keep them motivated they may not want to play all the time you have to critique them in a constructive way so they don't demotivate them. And you want to make everybody have fun and keep coming back and doing great, great work. That's, that's how I summarize. What do you think? That's a great yeah, no, I, think, I think you, think you said a really good, good idea. It's like it was the, the organization piece of it, right? So you have to organize, be organized, number one, and, and give simple instruction. I was going to call, you know, we, we can try to overcomplicate things in corporate America pretty easy. But when you think about, you know, children, you know, you really have to kind of break it down in very simplistic ways. And that really, if you think about in corporate America, it's the, the type of speak we use. And, and, and for me, I, I keep it simple. And we, we try to make that the simplistic way. So it's digestible. It's easy to remember the little nuggets of information that you're giving people on actions they need to take. Um, that's kind of one of my, my greatest you know, experiences ever was to coach kids. But then I'd usually tie back that exact same scenario, which is, options give people options and then to break it down and make it simple um so they don't have to continue to ask you a ton of questions for clarity <laughs> yeah because uh, to tony tony, tony pottle encapsulating what you were saying and then like manisha you have agency experience i don't know what the others i i come from agency years ago in an in agency recruiting your motivation is commission basically right that's your key motivator right. and i always like to see it all the corporate recruiting teams that i've been part of how do you stay motivated? Because recruiting can be a grind, right? So I always look to, to leaders who keep their team motivated in different ways. And that, that's where the empathy comes into place of it. Tony, back to little kids stuff. And again, I'm not trying to say recruiters are little kids or anything like that. But keep <laughs> that motivation level, because it can be a grind uh, day in, day out. Sometimes there's, right, you get a lot of no's before you get your yes. You, you get that offer done. They, they take a counter offer or what have you. It's, it can be that, that motivation factor of it. So I always like to see uh, leaders that motivate where it's like a, re recruiting. I always kind of getting back to the analogy of sports. I think it's a contact sport. There's 50 games in a year, one for each week. Throughout the end of the year, we throw out Thanksgiving. 
it's a week to week thing. Did I win this week or did I lose this week? And that's sort of how I always looked at it. But I love working for great motivating people and things like that. Uh, we're a little bit over. Any any final comments or, or thoughts on the topic? I'll kind of do a little quick little circle. Start with Kathy. Any final words or comments? Uh, no, I just uh, think you know as a team lead, it's 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 just important that we have our peers in mind, right? When we look at where they want to be and their growth, and you know where they want to develop, whether it's individually, right, and improve their pers their own personal skills, right, or professionally, because I think both are going to um, be valued in the workplace, right, when we better ourselves. So I, th I just think that that learning piece is, is vital, and very important. Anisha, any final words? Yeah, I think this kind of ties into just like what's going on, right? Like in the world with like COVID, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that are unemployed, right? And so it's definitely a interesting and for some folks, you know, um, hard to stay motivated, right? As they're searching for something new. And as, you know, a, I would say a leader in recruiting, um, I definitely think it's good to like somewhat pay it forward, right? So just to give you a quick example, and if you don't end up hiring a candidate, um, I get it. We don't have time to do this for everybody, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's a great idea to take that extra time to maybe give them a, some advice, right, on, hey, maybe these are some organizations that you should look at uh, without really expecting anything in return. And I've seen that, uh, you know, become fruitful, even just in terms of getting referrals and the appreciation that you get from the other side. I think that's both empathy and good business and just being a good human being. Uh, part of being that therapist that recruiters are many times in their daily lives. And Tony Rotan? And uh, actually, I really appreciate, again, the opportunity to, to, to be on here with, with, with these uh, other panelists as well. And, you know, Kathy, Manisha, you know, Tony. You know, being able to learn is important and, and learning from others. And, you know, we all don't have all the answers, but just hearing other people's perspectives, you know, is, is an enlightening opportunity for me to, to give me exposure to other people and hear what they have to say. And again, I can, things I can take away from just our, just our conversation today will help, again, go back to my teams as well and help them, you know, continue to stay motivated and kind of bring some nuggets from this and, and help them and encourage them as well to help stay motivated through this you know, kind of challenging time. When we get back to working in the same place, try wearing a coach's whistle and see what happens. <laughs> Tony Pottle, how about yourself? Yeah, you know, I've heard empathy, human connections, and motivation. And really that team lead role is to connect all that together with the why. Why are, why are they doing what they're doing? That's what happens through these tough days and the ups and downs uh, in the big picture. Why are you here? Why are you doing this? Like, for example, myself, it's, it's been for years reaching millions through personally touching thousands. And that's the phrase that comes into my head when I've had a bad day to say, yep, that's why I'm here, helping people get to where they want to go. So thank you, Sean. And that's been an honor working with each of you. My pleasure. So and I, there was one comment by Seth in the chat area about recruitment acumen. And I, I won't go too deep on it, but I'll be blunt. I kind of think that's a given or should be a given when you're talking about recruiting leader. I'd like to know this, the backstory behind that question uh, someday, Seth. Uh, sorry, we couldn't get to it today. But thank you, everybody. Uh, with that said, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the your rest of your week as we come into our weekend. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.